Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 82. Today, I'll be continuing my second series on animal physiology by diving into the world of neurons and nervous tissue. This is going to be a really cool episode, because it covers a body system that's at the frontier of biological research and is perhaps one of, if not the most, important body system. The nervous tissue has a wide range of roles in the body, from relaying signals from the conscious brain to the skeletal muscles to induce movement, to managing the unconscious beating of the heart and uh, other autonomous functions, to reflex behavior and sensory perception. Nervous tissue has evolved to be integrated into every other kind of tissue. This is most apparent in the fusion of nervous and muscle tissues, which allow the animal to rapidly move its body and transport itself across its environment. Now, the structure of the nervous system within the animal's body can take two generalized forms, depending on what species it is and how it lives. Nadarian animals, like jellyfish and sea anemones, and tenophore animals, like comb jellies, they all possess a decentralized nerve net. They don't have a primary brain or spine. Instead, they possess a diffuse arrangement of neurons that's called a nerve net. All the other animals, like arthropods and vertebrate animals, they all have a centralized nervous system, which is typically consolidated into a single brain and a spinal cord, and the nerves that innervate the body extend out from the spinal cord. The brain is the information processing hub, where all of the sensory data is compiled into a real-time awareness, perception of the world, and where both conscious and subconscious signals are sent out to control the body. All tissues are composed of a variety of different kinds of cells, and neural tissue is no exception. There are different kinds of neurons that have different functions. So for example, there are sensory neurons that form all the different kinds of sensors in the body from the nerve cells of the eyes and those connecting to the ears to the nerve cells that monitor internal body temperature and osmolarity. There's also motor neurons, which are integrated into muscles and glands. When a motor neuron is activated, it can stimulate muscles to contract or cause a gland to release its liquidy secretion. These sensory and motor neurons are connected to the brain through a series of interneurons that run along the spinal cord. The interneurons also connect sensory cells to motor cells and establish a general neural continuity between the brain and all of the sensory cells that are permeated throughout the body, and that these connections take the form of nerves. Nerves are basically thick fibers consisting of many bundles of neural cell axons. Nerves can branch off of the spinal cord and root through the limbs and into the organs and all through the animal's body. All of these nerves branching out of the spine and connecting to sensory cells in the skin or the organs or the genitals or the glands or the muscles, these nerves all compose the peripheral nervous system, or the PNS. The brain and the spinal cord, on the other hand, compose the centralized nervous system, or the CNS. And in a very general sense that applies to pretty much all animals, from the smallest sponge to the biggest vertebrates, a sensory stimulus, or a mechanical stimulus of some kind, will cause activity in the PNS, in the peripheral system. And this will send signals to the CNS, to the central nervous system, which processes the information in specialized brain regions, and then sends back out the signals for a response. Sometimes, like in the case of uh, reflexes in a limb, for example, the information from sensor to motor neuron is rooted through the spine, and it never even goes to the brain. But in any case, the end result of this exchange of information is some form of behavioral or autonomous change. So for example, if the animal senses that its body is too hot, it will pant or sweat or open its mouth or perform some other species-specific behavior to induce evaporation or radiation and cool down. If the animal senses that it's thirsty, it will induce water-seeking behaviors. If it senses it is threatened, it will invoke a defensive posture, which may take the form of receding into a shell, amputating a tail, spraying a noxious chemical or ink or something, simply running away, or even fighting back against the perceived threat. All of these processes, all of these behaviors, 
are ultimately controlled by the cells that form the neural circuits and the brain nuclei that process all of this sensory information and organize appropriate behavioral responses. So what do these neural cells look like? What is the cellular architecture that enables this body-spanning electrochemical signaling network to work? Well, let's start out with the very basics. Let's look at the neuron. The typical neuron is composed of three types of structures. So most obviously, you have the cell body, called the soma. And this holds the nucleus and all of the other organelles. It's like your typical cell body. And then there are the dendrites, which are short, little fiber-like projections that come about two millimeters out of the cell body and branch wildly to make numerous connections with other nearby neurons. Two millimeters might not sound like a lot, but when you're talking about cells that are measured in dozens or hundreds of micrometers, two millimeters is a pretty impressive distance for a a protrusion or an appendage like a dendrite. And the last major structure of the neuron is the axon, which is a large projection, like a long fiber, that extends out of the neuron. It's, it's It's kind of like a very long tail. The axon can grow to be over a meter in length, or even more in larger species. And this is how just a handful of neurons, just one to three in most cases, can connect your brain to your hands and your feet. Longer axons, like I said, exist in larger animals, like elephants, giraffes, and whales. In the giant squid, for example, the axons connecting the brain parts to the eyeballs are massive. So massive that they've actually become extremely useful for neurological research. Anyway, at the very end of the axon, the cell structure begins to branch wildly like the frayed ends of a rope. And all of these branching projections coming off of the end of the axon, they can all connect to other neurons, forming synapses of varying, alterable strength with with the dendrites of these other neurons. A given neural cell will receive incoming signals through its dendrites, and these will carry the signal directly to the soma, to the cell body. The cell body is where these incoming signals are organized and consolidated. A neural cell can have multiple signals coming in from multiple dendrites, and there's a summation effect at work here. You need to have enough activation caused from all of this dendritic feedback from upstream neurons that it's strong enough to induce an action potential in this current neuron to keep the information flow going down the circuit. Basically, if all of this incoming signal activity induces sufficient differences in the the charge of the soma membrane, then the cell body, the, the soma, will generate a new action potential that it will send down its own axon. This signal will reach all of the other neurons connected to the end of the axon. They'll receive it, and assuming there is sufficient excitation, they will send the the signal further down the chain of neurons with their own action potential. And so this, you can see, establishes a neural circuit, or part of a neural network. Now, this signal that gets propagated down uh, the, the dendrites and down the axon is called an action potential. And it's kind of tricky to visualize, but I think the action potential is best described as a kind of electrical pulse. It's a wave of membrane depolarization that flies down the length of the neuron. This depolarized pulse is an electrochemical signal, and when it reaches the end of the axon and it runs down the branching, fraying ends, it can induce some kind of action, like the release of chemicals called neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter is like a messaging chemical that's released from the very ends of all of these little frayed branches of the axon. The neurotransmitter will cross a very small gap called a synapse where it connects to the dendrite of the postsynaptic or the downstream neuron. If enough neurotransmitter crosses the synapse, binds to the downstream neuron, and activates some kind of response, then that downstream neuron can potentially create another action potential. And thus, the signal is propagated. Now, I talked about the action potential a little bit in my episode on animal movement and in the episode on animal sensoria. But today, I'll really dig into it in more detail than ever before. I've also talked extensively about ions and their concentration gradients, and how they'll tend to flow from areas of high to low concentration. Well, ions are, by definition, charged. They can be negatively charged or positively charged, 
and the charge itself can vary in strength, depending on the atomic features of the ion in question. When you have a lot of ions in a volume or an area, their collective charges can create a, a larger electrical landscape within and between the cells. If there's a negative charge on the outside of a cell and a positive charge on the inside, that can establish an electrical potential, or a voltage. When the electrical potential is spread across the inner and outer surfaces of a membrane, then that's called a membrane potential. Just like how large differences in concentration can create a stronger concentration gradient, larger differences in the membrane potential can create a stronger electrochemical gradient. The presence of ions immediately on the inner and outer surfaces of the membranes will contribute to the local charge, and thus to the, to the local membrane potential. Now, the membrane potential of a neuron is expressed in terms of the voltage on the inside of the membrane relative to the outside. So a membrane potential of, for example, negative 65 millivolts would mean that the inside of the membrane has a charge that's 65 millivolts more negative than the outside of the membrane. For the sake of determining membrane potential, the voltage on the outside of the membrane is considered to be zero, even if it's actually not. For example, if the inside and the outside of a membrane have a minus 100 millivolt and a minus 50 millivolt charge, respectively, then the membrane potential will be the difference between them, or 50 millivolts. Just like a concentration gradient, the membrane potential is a form of potential energy, because it depends on the position of matter. In this case, the matter is charged particles, like ions of calcium, sodium, potassium, and chlorine. These ions exist in both specific concentrations, and because of their particular charges, this also implies a particular electric charge. So this all combines to create the electrochemical gradient of the neuron's plasma membrane. So outside of the neural cell, there's negatively charged chloride ions and an abundance of positively charged sodium ions. On the inside of the cell, there's some sodium and some chloride ions, not much, but there's some. There's a few negatively charged organic molecules, like large amino acids, and there's a lot of positively charged potassium ions. Now, because of all of the amino acids and other organic anions, the inside of the membrane is generally more negatively charged than the outside of the membrane. The potassium, chloride, and sodium ions all move across the membrane according to their specific electrochemical gradient. There are membrane proteins that form ion-specific channels, and the ions diffuse through these channels. There are also membrane proteins that can physically carry one or more ions through the membrane, and there are also ion pumps that consume ATP, or chemical energy, to push ions across the membrane against their electrochemical gradient. Now, when the neuron is at rest, or it's not firing off any action potentials, its membrane is at resting potential. This is a steady, balanced energy state, where the electrochemical gradient is sustained at a comfortable minus 65 millivolts. So, most positively charged ions actually don't diffuse across the membrane at rest, except for potassium. The neural membrane has lots of potassium channels, which are called leakage channels, because they literally allow the potassium ions to leak out of the cell. The potassium ions leak out because they're moving along their concentration gradient, from high concentration inside the cell to low concentration outside. However, as these positively charged potassium ions leave the cell along their concentration gradient, the inside of the cell becomes more negative. This growing negative charge establishes an electrical gradient that will attract potassium ions back towards the inside of the cell. So these two chemical influences, the concentration and the electrical gradients, they will reach a point of equilibrium, where there's no net movement of potassium. The voltage required on the inside of the membrane to reach this balanced state is called the equilibrium potential for potassium ions. Even though sodium and chloride ions are largely contained on their side of the membrane, the neuron also expresses a small number of leakage channels that allow these ions to diffuse out as well. So even though it's a bit smaller, 
There's also equilibrium potentials for sodium ions and chloride ions. And now, the entire membrane potential is the totality of the accumulated ions and their charges, just like how the, the pressure of a mixed gas is the totality of the partial pressures of all of the individual constituent gases. Now, you might be wondering, why does the neuron have so much potassium inside and so much sodium outside? This is because of the sodium-potassium pump, which consumes one molecule of ATP to push three sodium ions out of the cell and bring two potassium ions back in, each of them being moved against their concentration gradients. The perpetual activity of the pumps not only maintains the separation of the ions, this also establishes those concentration and electrochemical gradients in the first place, and it maintains them. There wouldn't be a gradient if there weren't any sodium-potassium pumps stockpiling particular ions on one side of a membrane. All right, so you remember how a long time ago I mentioned action potentials? Well, this is where the action potential comes in. So the action potential is a rapid change in the membrane potential, which moves in a pulse down the length of the neuron, moving along the axon like a wave. The generation and the propagation of the action potential has three phases. So let's get into that right now. So the first phase is called depolarization, because the neuron's inner membrane will depolarize. Now, I spent a few minutes talking about the membrane potential and how it's the difference between the charge on the inside and outside of the membrane. Well, this depolarization phase involves the charge on the inside of the membrane quickly becoming less negative and more positive. The membrane potential suddenly drops as the difference in charges on the inside and the outside gets smaller. And for a brief moment, this sudden depolarization gets so strong that the inside of the membrane is actually more positively charged than the outside. So for a brief moment, it reverses. And then this is immediately followed by the repolarization phase, where the inside charge drops back down again, and the membrane potential returns to somewhere near resting. However, this repolarization is just as fast as the depolarization, and the inner charge will descend into the negative. It'll reach the hyperpolarization phase. In this phase, the inner membrane is hyperpolarized, which means it's extremely negative relative to the outside of the membrane. But then it comes back up a bit and smooths out and returns to the resting potential. The whole thing, with all three phases, takes only a few milliseconds. For an action potential to be generated in the first place, the neurons need to be sufficiently excited. So first, the membrane potential has to drop a certain amount to reach what's called a threshold potential. If the stimulation fails to get the membrane to reach that threshold potential, nothing happens. An action potential isn't generated. So uh, to reference what I was describing earlier, this is kind of like if a bunch of signal information is coming down from upstream neurons and they start activating all the dendrites on the downstream neuron, but say it's not enough, it's not enough activation that neuron won't produce an action potential, and the signal in this circuit will stop here. There's also no such thing as a partial action potential. It's an all-or-nothing process. You either have one or you don't. So if the membrane potential can reach that threshold, then it will generate an action potential and begin the depolarization phase. Now you might be wondering, what's the deal with this threshold potential? Why is it there? Kind of came out of left field. Well, the threshold is the point where the inner membrane depolarizes just enough so that the voltage-gated sodium channels open up and allow sodium to flow into the cell. A voltage-gated channel is a protein that's usually closed, but it's electrically sensitive, it's charge sensitive, and when it's exposed to a particular electrical environment, it will change its conformation. In this case, it'll open up and create a channel for sodium ions to flow through. The sodium flow will start and stop almost instantly, and the current, the, the rate of sodium ions flowing through it, is the same each time it opens. Okay, so let's start from the beginning here. We have a neuron at rest. Its resting membrane potential is about negative 65 millivolts. Now somewhere in the body there's some sensory input or something's going on that's stimulating an action potential to, to come down a circuit to reach our neuron here. 
And let's say that this, all of this signaling activity is reaching the dendrites and being carried through to the cell body, where it's trying to excite the cell by dropping the membrane potential, by, by shrinking that gap between the inside and outside membrane potential. So it's at rest at negative 65 millivolts, but then the signaling information comes in, and let's say it starts flickering up to negative 63, negative 61, negative 60, maybe even negative 57, negative 56. No action potential is generated because you haven't reached the threshold yet. But say there's, there's sufficient continual stimuli coming in from the, the upstream neurons that that membrane potential does reach, say, negative 55, negative 55 millivolts. Well, there you go. That's the threshold. Once it reaches that, uh, that voltage, that is the proper electrochemical environment to cause these voltage-gated sodium channels to change their conformation, to open up and let sodium ions rapidly flow into the cell. Now, this influx of positive charge from all of these sodium ions coming in, this will make the inside of the membrane much more positively charged. And this, this is what fuels that depolarization as more and more sodium channels open up uh, across just a few milliseconds. All of this takes place super fast. It's remarkable. For example, the sodium channels will stay open for about a millisecond, and then they close and enter an inactive refractory state for another one to two milliseconds. And during this lag period, this downtime, this uh, refractory state, the depolarization effect will stop, and then the potassium channels open. There's also voltage-gated potassium channels, but these are sensitive to a different voltage, to a more positive membrane potential. And so as you get this, this grand depolarization from the opening of the sodium channels, it'll create a new electrochemical environment that opens the potassium channels. When this happens, potassium ions will flow out of the cell rapidly, and they'll carry their positive charge with them. The inner membrane potential will begin to repolarize. It'll come back down, and you'll see uh, the, the difference between the inside and the outside membrane potential will increase again. Uh, the, the inside membrane potential will become more negative until it reaches hyperpolarization, before finally returning to resting potential. Okay, so as the action potential moves down the axon, in front of it, sodium ions are flowing into the cell, and behind it, potassium ions are flowing out. The positively charged sodium ions that come in will actually repel other positively charged particles, and these will get pushed further up the axon where they can begin to depolarize the membrane there. So this is a mechanism of forward propagation of the action potential. Incoming sodium ions help alter the electrical environment so that nearby sodium channels will begin to open. And this is what allows the action potential to slide down the length of the axon, being pulled, as it were, by the sweeping wave of membrane depolarization. And this is important, but it only moves in one direction because of that lag period or that refractory period in the sodium channels. This refractory period prevents those sodium channels from opening up again. If they did that, if they opened up right as they closed, then the action potential uh, would get pulled back and it might dissolve or break down. You, you wouldn't have proper directional signaling along the axon. It would be uh, much more chaotic and much less efficient. Also, the hyperpolarization phase that follows the, the main pulse, it makes it really hard for the membrane potential to quickly reach that threshold again. And this also prevents the action potential from sweeping back up the axon in the wrong direction. Now, once the action potential has been generated, there are several variables that influence its speed down the axon. So consider, if you will, an electrical circuit, like uh, electrical engineering. So if you, have, if you have a larger diameter of wire, it can carry a larger current. You, you can reduce uh, resistance in your wire by increasing the diameter. Similarly, in a larger neuron with a larger axon diameter, there's less resistance to the flow of cations, so the action potential can propagate down the axon faster. Another thing that can influence action potential speed is myelination. Neural tissue isn't just neurons. There's also a wide variety of support cells, like Schwann cells and oligodendrocytes. And these support cells will, among other things, wrap the nerves in a myelin sheath. In keeping with our electrical engineering metaphor, this myelin sheath on the neurons is very similar to electrical insulation. It prevents excess leakage of ions that can disrupt the carefully regulated membrane potential. 
This myelin is deposited in disconnected bands along the length of the axon. And in the small gaps between the bands, the neural membrane is exposed. And this is where sodium ions can come in and where potassium ions can go out. These open regions are called nodes of Ranvier, or Ranvier, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce the name. And uh, they're packed with ion channels that facilitates all of this inflow and outflow. Electrical signals can jump from node to node, which boosts the speed of the action potential compared to an unmyelinated nerve of the same diameter. And it should be pointed out that while humans and other mammals have pretty heavily myelinated nerves, other animals, such as some invertebrates, they actually don't have myelinated nerves, or the myelination is a bit different or less pronounced. So how do these action potentials translate into data that the brain can interpret in a meaningful way? Any given neuron will generate the same action potential, time after time. Every action potential that a given neuron will generate will be the same magnitude and the same duration. Whether you hear a loud sound or a quiet sound, the neurons in your ear will send action potentials of the same magnitude either way. The intensity of the stimulus detected by sensory cells is encoded into the electrochemical signal via frequency. So what this means is that if the sensory cells in your ear detect a louder sound, this will cause those neurons to generate a higher frequency of action potentials. A quieter sound will cause a lower frequency of action potentials. This holds true for the neurons in your eyes with respect to bright light and dim light, for the nociceptor neurons in your skin with respect to mild pain and intense pain, and for thermal sensors with respect to hot and hotter temperatures. Okay, so I've explored the neuron, and I've explored the phases of the action potential. So, what happens next? What happens when the action potential reaches the end of the axon? Recall how earlier I mentioned that at the very end of the axon, there's a burst of branching protrusions, like the frayed end of a rope. Well, all, all of these protrusions end in terminal axon uh, branches, or terminal axon buttons, and they connect to the dendrites of other neurons, where they form synapses. A synapse is the extremely small gap separating the membrane of two neurons, typically the axon of one neuron and the tip of a dendrite of another. So to visualize this, imagine that you have two flat-topped light bulbs, and you're holding them so that the glass parts are pointing towards each other. If you hold them just a few millimeters apart, this is kind of what the synapse looks like between the limbs of two neurons. The axon bringing the action potential to the synapse is part of the presynaptic neuron. And the other neuron, which is receiving the signal in some form, is the postsynaptic neuron. Now, within the tip of the presynaptic neuron, in this terminal button, there are floating vesicles. They're like these little membrane bubbles. And these little bubbles are filled with chemicals called neurotransmitters. So the action potential comes down the axon, and it stimulates calcium ion channels to open. Calcium ions will flow into the presynaptic neuron, and all of this calcium will cause the synaptic vesicles to bind to the inner surface of the neural membrane. The vesicle membranes will fuse with the neural membrane, and the contained neurotransmitters will get released into the synapse, into this synaptic cleft. These neurotransmitters will bind to receptors on the postsynaptic neuron, and this will cause ion channels on the postsynaptic neuron to open. The ions flowing into the postsynaptic membrane can cause a depolarization effect, and this in turn will generate a new action potential and perpetuate the signal further down the chain of neurons. Some of the channels opened can let in positive ions, but others can also let in negative ions, like chloride. Now this is kind of cool, because the action potential is an electrical signal that gets turned into a chemical signal in the form of the neurotransmitter, and when these bind to the receptors on the postsynaptic neuron, that chemical signal gets changed back into an electrical signal. Remember that the postsynaptic neurons need to reach the threshold potential before they can generate an action potential. Any changes to the membrane potential that move it closer to the threshold and thus make them more likely to generate an action potential, any changes like that are called excitatory postsynaptic potentials, or EPSPs.
Conversely, any changes that hyperpolarize this postsynaptic membrane and move it further away from the threshold are called inhibitory postsynaptic potentials, or IPSPs. These excitatory or inhibitory signals are very small and very short-lived, because the neurotransmitters, they don't stay bound to the receptors for very long, so the ion channels aren't open for very long either. If an EPSP and an IPSP happen in quick succession, they can actually cancel each other out, and the net effect on the postsynaptic neuron is nothing. But if enough EPSPs happen in quick succession, they can stimulate that postsynaptic neuron enough that it will generate a new action potential. Okay, I want to shift gears here for a moment and move away from the, the neuron and the action potentials and move towards the bigger picture. Earlier in the episode, I mentioned the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system. The peripheral nervous system includes all of the nerves besides the brain and spine. The brain and spine is the CNS, the central nervous system. Now, the peripheral nervous system is divided into two nerve groups. One group is called the afferent division, and this is connected to sensory organs and other sensor structures, and it relays information back to the central nervous system. The other group of peripheral nervous system neurons is called the efferent division, and this group takes signals from the CNS and propagates them out to the rest of the body. So you can see some directionality here in the afferent and efferent divisions of the peripheral nervous system. This efferent division that sends out signals from the CNS to the rest of the body, this system can be further subdivided into two more groups, called the somatic and autonomic nervous systems. So the somatic nerves carry out all voluntary responses. So for example, the somatic nerves will activate the skeletal muscles and allow the animal to deliberately control its limbs. Autonomic nerves, on the other hand, carry out involuntary responses. So the autonomic nerves will make your heart beat, they'll make your intestinal organs engage in peristalsis, and they'll make your glands secrete whatever it is that the gland secretes. So the peripheral nervous system is divided into two groups. And one of those, the efferent division, is further subdivided into two more groups, the somatic and the autonomic nerves. The autonomic nerves can be further subdivided into two more groups, called the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems. Now both of these nerve groups carry involuntary signals from the central nervous system, but they stimulate different kinds of behaviors in the animal. The parasympathetic nerves include three cranial nerves coming straight out of the brain and brainstem, as well as the sacral nerves at the bottom of the spine. The sympathetic nerves branch out of the thoracic and lumbar sections of the spine, that's more in the torso section. Now, the parasympathetic nervous system is responsible for calming the animal and encouraging the body to engage in rest and digest processes. Parasympathetic nerves help to slow the heartbeat and lower blood pressure and they stimulate the digestive tract to engage in peristalsis to facilitate digestion. Furthermore, the parasympathetic nerves can constrict the pupils, they constrict the airways as the body has a low demand for oxygen, and they can stimulate the genitals to engage in sexual activity. Now, for most of these organs and structures, the sympathetic nervous system is the opposite. The sympathetic nervous system excites the animal and puts its body into a stressful fight-or-flight mode. The sympathetic nerves excite the heart, making it beat faster and harder. They put a stop to peristalsis and digestion so that the animal's body can redirect energy and nutrients to the muscles. They open the airways so more oxygen can be inhaled to fuel muscular activity and more waste CO2 can be released. And the sympathetic nerves cause the adrenal glands to release adrenaline. In fight-or-flight mode, the animal needs to fight off its attacker, or it needs to run away and escape. The stakes are high, so all non-essential functions are put on pause. Here's an interesting little fact. So even though the parasympathetic nerves stimulate the genitals to get them ready for sex, like uh, arousal, the sympathetic nervous system is actually what causes the muscular contractions and the ejaculation that characterize an orgasm. It's a good example of how integrated these systems really are and why you shouldn't oversimplify the functions of organs and body parts as being operated wholly by either the sympathetic or parasympathetic systems.
So in all of this talk of the peripheral and central nervous systems and this exchange of information going back and forth from the brain to the body, you might have gotten the impression that the spinal cord plays a really important connective role here. And it does. The spinal cord is like an information conduit or an information superhighway that runs along the length of the animal's body. It connects the information superprocessor, the brain, to the rest of the nerves that innervate the rest of the body and provide tactile sensation and send out motor instruction. Now, onto the topic of the brain itself. The brain is a massive, hyperconnected mass of neural tissue that integrates all of the incoming data from all of the body's sensors and nerves and compiles it into a coherent, real time awareness of both the external world and the conditions inside the animal's body. Now, the vertebrate brain has four main regions, or structural divisions, which take different shapes and sizes depending on the species in question. The lowest region is the brain stem, which is like the brain's root that leads to the spine. This is sometimes called the lizard brain because it regulates purely basal autonomic functions, like the heartbeat, peristalsis, etc. Behind the brainstem is the cerebellum, which is a very highly folded structure involved in coordinating complex movements. The cerebellum gives the animal the ability to coordinate its movement so that it can effectively walk or run or fly or swim. It allows the animal to move over complex geography and to engage in intense, high finesse movements like tackling prey or avoiding predators. When you talk about the cerebellum, you're talking about that sophistication of motor control that allows for precision attacks or highly dexterous manipulation of appendages. That's the function of the cerebellum. Positioned right above the brainstem is the diencephalon, which is a small region positioned in the core of the brain. The diencephalon does two things. It helps maintain homeostasis within the animal's body and it helps relay sensory information from the spine and the brainstem into the cerebrum. And the cerebrum is the fourth and final region of the brain, and it's also the largest. The cerebrum enables abstract thought and other forms of conscious thinking, as well as learning and memory. The size of the cerebrum, the structural complexity of its neural connections, and higher ratios of gray to white matter are all variables strongly correlated with the animal's intelligence. In fish, for example, the cerebrum is relatively small and simple. It's involved mostly in processing olfactory data coming in from its nose, or its olfactory sensors, and vibratory data coming from the mechanoreceptors in its lateral line. In contrast, in birds and mammals, especially in cetaceans, elephants, and the great apes, including humans, the brain is quite large and complex. This complexity manifests in several ways. So most obvious are the extensive folding patterns in the cerebrum. These folds increase the surface area of the cerebrum, providing more space for clumps of neural cell bodies to cooperate as brain nuclei. This is super important because more nuclei suggests more capabilities which in turn suggests more complex behaviors. Another form of brain complexity manifests as connections between neurons. So having more neurons is great, but if they only have limited connections to each other, the result can be inefficient or even deleterious. Some examples include fewer dendritic connections between neurons, weaker synapses that produce weaker postsynaptic potentials, leading to little to no reinforcement, learning, or even responses to stimuli, as well as low variation or interconnection between nuclei or subnetworks of neurons, which can lead to behavioral rigidity and a general inability for the animal to adjust its approach or respond creatively to challenging or novel situations. Now, the cerebrum is split into left and right hemispheres, connected with a thick sheet of axons called the corpus callosum. Among the more specific regions of the brain, uh, you have the occipital lobe in the back of the brain. The occipital lobe, as you might have guessed from the name, is connected to the eyes, and it processes visual information. And then there's the parietal lobes, kind of uh, in the middle top of the brain, which are involved in processing tactile sensory information like texture, pressure, and temperature. There's the temporal lobes on either side of the brain, which are involved in, among other things, 
memory, and processing auditory information from the ears, and the frontal lobe is the largest, and it's involved in abstract thought, emotion, temperament, social behavior, and other aspects of the individual's personality. All of these brain regions interact via networks, networks of neurons that carry information in ordered, structured ways, so as to properly manage the internal conditions and the external behaviors of the animal. So for example, let's consider some predatory animals. Hunting behavior in predators is regulated by two major neural circuits. One of them is involved in tracking, stalking, and pursuing prey, and the other neural circuit is involved in attacking, capturing, and handling prey. Now both neural circuits run through the sensory cortices of the cerebrum, the salience processing systems of the basal ganglia, and the emotional processing system of the amygdala, but at this point, they diverge to activate different chains of downstream brain nuclei, and this is what results in the different behavioral outcomes, stalking and tracking prey versus launching an attack, performing the actual attack, and then handling the prey after the attack. Curiously, this two-circuit design only exists in predators with jaws. Lampreys and other jawless fish only have one neurological predatory circuit, which makes this a very fascinating example of the neurological and behavioral aspects of a major evolutionary change, like a physiological alteration to the face and mouth that radically alters the ability to interact with the environment and capture food. Similar neural circuits exist for virtually every kind of instinctual or repetitive behavior. For example, many birds have neural circuits allowing them to rapidly identify and prioritize the patterns of the open mouths of their young chicks, so they know who to give food to. This is important because there's many species of bird who engage in a kind of parasitic behavior. These parasitic birds will lay their eggs in another bird's nest, usually a bird of another species. And when the chicks are born, they'll pretend to be the chicks of the, uh, of the host species. And so when that parent comes back to its nest with a belly full of fish or something and it's trying to feed its chicks, it will inadvertently feed this chick that's not its own, this parasite chick that's pretending to be one of its own. In a kind of evolutionary arms race, birds have evolved the neurological and psychological mechanisms to discriminate between their chicks and parasite chicks so they can feed only their chicks. But because this is an evolutionary arms race, those parasite chicks are also evolving more sophisticated ways to mimic the host bird's chicks. Additionally, the songs that are sung by songbirds are tightly encoded by neural circuitry, as are the more instinctual fear response cries made by many primates. For example, consider an individual lemur spotting a snake or an eagle or some other dangerous predator. It'll make an alarm cry that will communicate this information to the rest of its, uh, its tribe or its group. Well, a lot of these, these neural circuits that code for these instinctual fear response cries they're similar not just across members of one species, but across members of related species. Mating behaviors are also tightly controlled by neural circuits, including the repetitive thrusting of males and the receptive lordosis behaviors of females. Believe it or not, one of the neural circuits involved in predation, uh, the one involved in stalking, tracking, and pursuing prey, it uses one of the same brain regions, or it activates one of the same brain regions that's also involved in the expression of lordosis behavior in sexually receptive females. This brain region is known as the periaqueductal gray, or the periaqueductal gray nuclei, also called the PAG. Across virtually all animal species, mating dances, threat displays, recognition of significant visual patterns, all kinds of behaviors like this are tightly governed by conserved neural circuits. However, not all behaviors are so inflexible. Not all behaviors are so tightly regulated or stereotyped. The animal's brain is also plastic and adaptive to varying degrees. When there isn't any sensory input of immediate consequence, such as the detection of a predator or a receptive potential mate, these hardwired circuits aren't as active. Neural activity isn't as constrained. Behaviors can be regulated by a larger diversity of overlapping neural circuits and neural systems, which enables more behavioral flexibility and more behavioral complexity, as opposed to the rigid or semi-rigid, more instinctual responses that are encoded by those deeper, hardwired neural circuits, the ones that are involved in hunting or mating or what have you.
This open-ended neural activity can facilitate, in addition to more complex and more flexible behaviors, it can also facilitate learning and memory. The creation and formation of these psychological associations between actions or sensory inputs and various outcomes. As the animal lives its life, it will engage in behaviors and have experiences. These experiences provide feedback to the animal's brain and can actually change the neural physiology and chemistry of the brain itself. Behaviors and experiences that are rewarding or that offer a benefit to the animal will often be reinforced. The neurons involved in learning new information can release serotonin, which affects the behavioral neurons involved in the experience. This can make behavioral neurons more sensitive to synaptic stimulation, and thus encourage stronger responses to similar stimuli in the future. Conversely, negative experiences that cause stress or pain can be discouraged, and the animal will engage in avoidance behavior around the stressor or the threat or you know, whatever the danger is. This dynamic responsiveness of the brain structure to the animal's life and lived experiences demonstrates synaptic plasticity, which is the trait of the brain that allows the animal to learn and alter its behavior accordingly. Now, this might sound simple and relatively basic, but it's actually phenomenally complicated. The neural system in general is phenomenally complicated, and it's also amazing and mysterious. The neural system is the seat of consciousness, but how exactly the brain generates consciousness, uh, how it generates a conscious awareness, that is a huge area of interest in modern neural research. You might have heard this phrased as the hard problem of consciousness. So there's a lot of softer problems or smaller problems of consciousness, which might involve specific mechanistic questions or physiological issues, such as how is an actual potential generated? How are neural circuits formed? How do they reinforce each other? You know, how, do, how do these mechanisms of plasticity work? All that stuff. But how exactly all of these chemicals and chemical systems and cells working together, how all of this extremely complex cooperation leads to the emergence of a perceiving awareness that has its own experience of the world around it. It's not just like, an, like a philosophical zombie, so to speak, but how the neurochemistry can do this, can generate this awareness, is unknown. It's one of the, the biggest mysteries of science, and it's one of the primary reasons why neuroscience is at the frontiers of human understanding. Man, I love this field. It's awesome. But unfortunately, we have come to the end of the episode. I hope you enjoyed learning about the animal's nervous system, because it's just a stunningly incredible part of animal physiology. Now, if you wanted me to go into more detail on the human nervous system and the human brain, don't worry. I got you covered. I have planned a whole series of episodes about just that topic. We're not going to get there quite yet. We've got a ways to go before we get there. All right, guys, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, hit that bell, and be sure to check out the next episode on animal hormones. That'll be a really fun and important episode. And as always, thanks for listening. Oh.